Hello and welcome back. Today I will continue looking at the common collector transistor amplifier by building and testing out such a circuit. I will be going through most of the parameters we looked at in the simulator to check how well they match the real life implementation. As test circuit I will be using the design that was simulated last time so make sure to see that episode before this one. So if you're curious then keep watching. So let's get right to it. The circuit we are analyzing today is based on the simulations we looked at last time. It's a common collector amplifier with an emitter resistor and a resistor divider used to drive the base. And the AC signal is coupled through a set of DC blocking capacitors. So I took the circuit and adapted it into a practical board. Now as you may notice there are quite a few extra components here, however most of these are unplaced. The reason being that the PCB I ended up designing is intended to be used to test out all of the other transistor configurations as well. So specifically for the common collector amplifier, the components that are placed are the two connectors. So first of all an input connector and an output connector. These are linked through 22 microfarad capacitors. And then the transistor has a biasing network on the base and an emitter resistor. Finally, the collector is connected to the supply voltage through a zero ohm resistor. And to finish things off, I also included a supply connector and a couple decoupling capacitors. If we move to the PCB layout, it's a two layer design, so one layer is completely ground flood. And on this other layer, which is visible at the moment, we have all of the components and the various interconnections. Now to make life easy, I used all of the components as through hole type. So these are much easier to assemble and from the disposition of the components on the board these mainly follow the schematic. So we have our input connector, signal comes in through the capacitor, goes into the base of the transistor which is also connected to the resistor divider and then the output branch, so the emitter, is connected to ground again through R1 and then through another capacitor to the output. And this is the final board, a 5 by 5 centimeter design with a set of spacers at each corner, just so it sits nicely on the table. Let's start testing it. So first things first, we need to check that the circuit is working correctly by checking the bias point and the overall current consumption. For that, I prepared the setup where I'm supplying the board from a 10 volt power supply through an amp meter. And then I have a secondary voltmeter to perform various measurements. So if we connect the power supply we can see that we have about 38 milliamps of current consumption for the entire board. And now we can determine how much of this is going through the collector circuit and how much through the base resistor network. So first of all, we can measure the collector emitter voltage, which is about 2.4 volts. So our desired operating point was at 2.5 volts, but we're quite close. And we can determine the emitter current by measuring the voltage drop on the emitter resistor, 7.6 volts, and from this, knowing that the emitter resistor is 200 ohms, we can determine that approximately 38 milliamps of the 38.5 is going through the emitter. So most of the current running through the circuit is running through the emitter collector circuit. So everything is working as expected so far. Next, we can check the AC performance of the amplifier by seeing just what signal amplitudes can be passed through the amplifier without distortion. So last time we've seen that we should be able to pass a signal that is 3 volts peak to peak amplitude without getting distortion. So to check this, I prepared the setup in which the amplifier is supplied from the same 10 volts as before, but this time we do have a signal connection. So I got my signal generator to input a signal into the input side of the amplifier. And I'm also measuring this with the first channel of the oscilloscope. And then on the output, I have a 50 ohm load. And I'm also measuring this with the second channel of the oscilloscope. Now as test signal, I have a 10 kilohertz signal, which we can start with a one volt peak to peak amplitude. So if we do this and we observe the input and output signal, so the yellow and blue one, I set the same reference point for both of them so that we can see both of them have the same amplitude the gain of the amplifier is more or less 1, 
the output signal is not inverted in reference to the input, so it's perfectly in phase. And we can see that at the moment, there is no distortion appearing. So next, we can try to increase the signal amplitude. So if we slowly go higher, maybe change the voltage ratio a bit. So we're up to two volts peak to peak, still the same signal is appearing. Three volts, no distortion. But if we go a bit higher, we can start to see the bottom side of the output signal hitting a minimum value. So as expected, at very high input signal voltages, the lower side of the output signal starts to flatten out. However, we can amplify the 3 volt peak to peak signal that we were expecting. Next, we can check the frequency dependence of the amplification of the circuit. So we know that if we measure directly at the input and directly at the output, the gain of the circuit will be more or less 1, regardless of frequency. However, as frequency increases, since the transistor's gain decreases, the input current will start to increase, and this will have an impact on the amplifier's performance. So to get a more clear picture of the voltage amplification of the circuit, we can measure before the input impedance of the signal source. So to do that, I prepared this setup, where the output load and measurement point is exactly the same as before. However, on the input side, I added this 4.7 kilo ohm series resistance to represent a high input impedance signal source. And we can plot the amplification of the circuit by measuring before this impedance and while well, at the output. And to perform the characterization, I will be using the Bode plot function of the oscilloscope. So measuring from 1 kilohertz up to about 50 megahertz. If we do this and wait for the measurement to finish, of course, we can see that the amplifier has a flat response up until a certain frequency. And our minus 3 decibel point, so the flat region is at about minus 7 decibels, 3 decibels below this is minus 10, is occurring at about 2.5 megahertz. So with a 4.7 kilo ohm input impedance, our 3 decibel bandwidth is up to about 2.5 megahertz. After this, the gain starts to drop off because of the increasing input current and the decreasing input impedance. Now, the amplifier is still providing power gain even after this point. However, this attenuation may or may not be acceptable based on your specific use case. Speaking of impedance, next, let's try to measure it. For that, I prepared the setup here with the amplifier and a nano VNA, so a vector network analyzer. I set this device to measure between 100 kHz and 100 MHz and to plot out the absolute impedance and the phase shift. So the scale is linear, but that will be okay. So to perform the measurement, I connected an output load to the amplifier, 50 ohm termination, and I will be connecting the measurement device to the input side. If we do this and we scroll through the values a bit, we can see that we have a very large impedance at 100 kilohertz, so 5.6 kilo ohms, and this slowly drops as frequency increases. So at around 1 megahertz we have 3 kilo ohms, this drops to 2.2 kilo ohms at 2 megahertz, and so on. And even at 100 megahertz we still have about 59 ohms. Now to measure the output impedance, we can perform the same measurement, so just swapping the measurement point to measure the output of the amplifier, and I will also connect a 5 kilo ohm load on the input, just so that both ports are defined. So I change the scale a bit, and now we can observe that the output impedance starts at a very low value of about 5 ohms at 100 kilohertz, and this slowly increases with frequency. So at 1.8 megahertz we are at about 20 ohms, 30 ohms at 3.7 megahertz, and so on. And even at 100 megahertz we're at about 45 ohms. Now the values that we've seen are not exactly those from the simulator, but these are to a certain extent also related to the components used and the board layout. Regardless, we can still observe that the input impedance is very high and the output impedance is very low, especially at relatively low frequencies where the transistor has sufficient gain. Speaking of impedance and gain, direct power measurement is not that easy to perform in real life. So in the simulator, we looked at the input voltage and current, 
and the output voltage and current. And multiplying these was no issue to figure out the power gain. However, for the real life measurement, we can make a simplification. Since the voltage gain is more or less 1. So the input voltage is more or less equal to the output voltage. So we can write the power as the voltage squared divided by the impedance. And since the two voltages are more or less equal, we can rewrite the power gain as the ratio of input impedance to output load, which in our case is 50 ohms. So if we divide the input impedance by 50, or whatever output load is present, we should get the power gain of the amplifier. So I put back the setup to measure the input side impedance of the amplifier with 50 ohms on the output, and I changed the scale of the device to go up to 300 megahertz. So we can figure out the unity power gain point at the frequency at which the input impedance reaches 50 ohms. So if we do this, and we go through the points, we can see we're at 50.05 at 114 megahertz. So we can say that this amplifier has a power gain of 1 at 114 megahertz. And well, if we want to figure out the power gain at a different frequency, well, we can just take the impedance and divide it by 50. Last thing we can check is the impact of the exact values of the base resistor divider on the overall performance of the amplifier. So last time we've seen that if we change the resistors to smaller values, we end up getting a decrease in power gain, but at the same time the corner frequency moves to a higher value. So by reducing the resistors in the divider, we get a flat response for a wider frequency range. In a similar fashion, if we look at impedance behavior, if we use larger values for the resistor divider, we get higher input impedance, as well as higher output impedance, and if we go for the lower values, both of these impedances end up decreasing. So we can expect that the input impedance goes from 4 kilo ohms down to about 500 ohms, and the output should go from around 9 ohms down to around 2.7. So I changed the resistors in the circuit to highlight the simulated circuit, and I also saved the previously measured impedance traces on the network analyzer. So first off, we can start by measuring the input side impedance with the 50 ohm load on the output, and we can compare this to the green trace. So the green was the previous circuit. If we look through the values a bit, we can see that we have around 500 something ohms as input impedance, and after a certain frequency, the two impedances become more or less the same, so between the previous circuit and the current one. So as the gain becomes smaller and smaller, we have a stronger impact from the output side impedance, which is the same in both cases. If we now turn to output side impedance, now we're comparing to the red trace. Again, we see much lower values than before. So we see we're starting off at about 2.4 ohms, and we stay at relatively smaller values than before, up until a certain frequency, so somewhere in the 20-30 MHz range, after which again the two impedances become more or less the same. But by changing the resistor divider, we could see a very clear impedance change at relatively low frequencies. Both input and output impedances have been decreased. In the end, whether the common collector amplifier is the right choice or not, depends on your specific application. If no voltage gain and a high impedance ratio is needed, output impedance being significantly lower than input impedance, then the common collector amplifier should be considered. But if you have different needs, well, there are a couple more types of connections at which we will be looking at a different time. But for now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated to automatic videos. And see you next time. Bye-bye.